18 month old baby that had fallen down this well casing in a backyard in Midland, Texas. And that night about 9.30, I get a call from a colleague who was in a similar business. He used machinery to drill holes underneath roadways where we, we build tunnels and of bigger diameters. He's very small diameters, but he had done some of the bigger and he had gotten some technical challenges uh, through the years. And I had gone out there twice to help him and train some of his people how to get around those. And he called me and said, hey, we could really use you guys out here in this rescue. And I said, Bill, we'd be out there in a heartbeat, but we need to make sure we'll, we'll be welcomed. You don't just storm into a scene with first responders and say, I'm the expert, you need to get out of the way. And uh, we, he said, well, I'll get the okay. I said, well, just, just call me anytime tonight. You can wake me up. Of course, 1987, if I had a cell phone, it was probably a bag phone. Uh, but I, I knew I had one in my car, but I, it, it, I didn't have one in the house. But I waited the next day, and I did have a cell phone because I was out on one of our sites, and we had a, a crane operator working for us that normally it wasn't part of our workforce. And I gave him my cell phone, and I said, I'm expecting a call. If I get a call, come get me. And I went in, went, went down the ladder, and went up in the tunnel we were building. And I came out, and I asked him if he had any, gotten any calls. He said no, and he said, why, you know, what's so important? And knowing that it's often better just to be truthful than hide things, because this, particularly with this type of personality, he could conjure up all kinds of scenarios why I was expecting an important phone call. So I went ahead and told him, and about every hour he would call me, have you heard anything? Every hour, after he got home, and I said no. And then <clears throat> somewhere about 9 o'clock on Thursday night, I get a call, we're ready for you to come out. Uh, so I start checking, and by the time we'd gathered up the tools we needed, there was no way we could get on Southwest Airlines to fly to Midland. So he says, this crane operator, I've got us a plane. Okay, so I think we go to Love Field to get on general aviation, to get on a plane that I think's donated, and I'm early in my career, and <laughs> the first thing they do is ask me for a credit card. And I said, holy crap. <laughs> and, uh, well, here's credit card. And at the same time, I'm thinking that, uh, okay, I'm going because I've got a skill and I've got a talent and I've got people that I think I should be doing this. That's the way I was trained. That's my spiritual belief. And, and I said, okay, God, <laughs> you want me to go? You better figure out how to, I'm going to pay for this <laughs> with other than robbing the college fund for the kids. <laughs> and uh, so we get out there, and lo and behold, the the whole story in, in uh, the a dominant Midland personality had reached out to grab somebody from the Mine Safety Administration in that was working in the Roswell area on the pilot uh, nuclear waste project. And he had taken over, and when we got there, the, the police actually picked us up at the airport and brought us, so we think, okay, we are official. And, but the police chief and the fire chief were gone that, by the time we got out there, and it's midnight, uh, and we get there, and uh, this guy with, MS, with the Mine Safety Administration would not let us participate. So I kind of walked away, and I was trying to cool off, and the county sheriff walks over, and, and I don't know who it was at the time, what his name was, but I remember he was about 6'6 and looked like Buford Pusser. And I, he said, is there something wrong? And I explained what, who we were and what our experience was and why we felt like we could help. And <laughs> he said, just a minute. And I witnessed him walk to the mine safety guy, and I could overhear the conversation and he asked, why aren't you letting him? And he said, because I'm going to do it my way, and I'm not letting anybody else in there, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the sheriff tried to reason with him, 
And next thing I know, the sheriff is reaching around, grabbing the guy by the back of the collar, and this guy's 5'5", five, five maybe, and picks him up so they're at their eye level and says, this is my county, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And they're going in that hole and put him down. So myself and, and the one guy I took with me went down, and we worked with the local folks, and there was another guy who had come in from a company out of San Antonio that had similar type of experience. And uh, one of the first things myself and my expert did was we began enlarging the hole. You think, okay, we've got to go from here eight, ten feet over to where this well casing is. You don't want to dig any more than you have to. That's absolutely true. But yet you have to dig, so, dig an area big enough that you can efficiently work. And when you had to crawl in like this because you could, couldn't bring your arms if they were behind you, you couldn't bring them in front of you. So we began enlarging the hole and then worked through the night and the next next day. And we did a couple of things that uh, we felt like would make it a better way to go about it, and uh, including putting a, a bar. We Once we broke into the well, which at that point was not cased, we suggested and they took our advice to go across the well and knock out a little hole a few inches deep and put a bar across so that sh if should she fall she couldn't fall below us and uh, <clears throat> and we were there and they made one attempt but they the paramedic as he went in we they we felt like we needed to keep working but they wanted to try and part of the problem was he couldn't get his hands from his body up to reach her until he got his head on the other side of the well. So we made a hole for his head and then he went in and got her. And the rest of the story is as good as being there. And of course, we know that there's TV trucks everywhere. We don't know that the whole nation's watching because we're not watching the TV. We're not hearing all this. And uh, the they get her out of the well, we're there to witness that, and uh, we begin packing things up, and the police are gonna take us back to the airport. We go back to the airport, and not only was I n lacking the resource to char charter a plane financially, I was also lacking the experience resources to not tell them to go home immediately, because they've been sitting there for 36 hours on my nickel, and by this time, it's well into the five figures. I don't remember how much it was gonna cost, and, and we get on the plane, and uh, the pilot says, well, I've got some bad news. Uh, number one, since we've been sitting here, we've had to charge you, and it's a lot more money now, and number two, there's thunderstorms between here and Dallas. It may take us a while, and I said, well, what's a few more hours <laughs> by this point? <laughs> and, but the co-pilot was a guy from Britain, and he turns around and he says, but I got the good news. In his very British accent, he said, I remember last year when they opened the Eiffel Tower after it had been rehabbed, uh, hearing in the news that American Express had donated some 14, 15 million to that. So having you use your American Express card, I decided that if they can give that much money to the stupid French, I'm gonna call them and ask them to pay for this flight. And so they did. So that's, yeah, yeah. So that's the rumor. And I, I've go to the, the first thing that happened 